Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How are you guys doing? And welcome to the sixth session of the Sharh or the explanation of Al Londoniya. Today, inshallah, we're going to be talking about liberalism, in particular the political strand of liberalism. So, we're going to listen to uh, the poem, inshallah ta'ala, and then we are going to come back and start discussing the issues. Faslun fil liberaliya ti siyasiya, wa aslu hadha akdun ijtimai. والمرء طائع لأي داعي دعا له الدستور والقانون وإن أبا فإنه مسجون والمسلمون يسمعون أمرا ممن عليهم تولى أمرا ثم ترى جماعة الليبرالي بكل جرأة على المقال بأننا رجعية نقطع لسارق وللكفور نقطع فكيف أوجبوا على من حكموا أن يسمعوا قانونهم وألزموا ثم أتوا لنقد حكم المسلم أما رأوا قبيحهم في العالم so, inshallah, today what we're going to be doing is we're going to go back to a little bit of epistemology and uh, liberal epistemology for that matter. And we're going to quickly go through some of the historical points because in the last session we did cover some of the philosophical points, especially with social liberalism. But it's important to tie this in with some of the history. And then we're going to talk about human rights um, uh, because human rights clearly is, is, a, is an idea which is connected to liberalism. We're going to spend some time on this idea actually because it's important for us to know what they mean by it. What are the human rights in the Convention, uh, the 30 human rights, we're going to kind of cover those. Um, when did they become popular? Uh, and then we're going to look at the social contract, which is a very big part of political liberalism, or laql ishtimai, as the poem refers to it as. And we'll make, some co we'll make some comparisons between the social contract in Islamic um, political theory, if you want to put it that, that way, and also between uh, contractarianism in liberalism. Um, so that's really, really what we're going to go through today. So let's start off with uh, some of the epistemological stuff that we sp spoke about last lesson to kind of um, interleave, if you like, what we studied in the previous session with what we are studying in this session. So what are some of the principles that facilitate the liberal framework? Some of the things that liberalism is predicated on. My friend here, what's uh, some of the principles? What do liberals... Uh, assume. Um, we could say the hedonistic principle. Yes. The so say the, the what principle? The hedonistic, hedonistic, hedonistic principle. principle. Yeah, yeah. yeah so the hedonistic principle. Uh, we live. Uh, basically, we have two doors: pain and yes. pleasure. Yes. Good. 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 Right. Um, so, so this you, you're bringing it to Bentham, but it's connected, right? So the idea that. You know, you've got these visceral desires and or you have these uh, kind of inclinations and whatever and that you should be allowed to enact those inclinations, you should be allowed to do those things that you want to do. Uh, what other things did we sp speak about in the previous session which is relevant here? Some of the principles, some of the um, premises of, uh, of liberalism. Utilitarianism? Alright, so with social liberalism, right, you're right, social liberalism, utilitarianism, is, there's a connection there. Uh, the connection is, we talked about um, J.S. Mill and how he kind of put the harm principle in place and so on in order to avoid this kind of anarchical state. Uh, so we spoke about that. But do you know, it's really interesting as well because if you look at John Locke in particular, if you look at where he was seen as, some consider him the founder of liberalism, and this is an interesting point, who is the founder, of who is the first liberal, if you like. So some say it's Thomas Hobbes. Um, he wrote a book called The Leviathan and he... We'll talk about him today, actually. He had his own kind of the theoretical constructions. Some say it might be John Locke. And when John Locke, who died in 1706 or something like this, um, when John Locke was making his argument for liberalism, he was uh, debating against someone called Filmer. This Filmer, I think it's Robert Filmer, was um, another person who was obviously a Christian as well. And so a lot of the arguments used to actually be theological arguments. So really interestingly, a lot of the points of liberalism and that you find in the Constitution and the, um, the Declaration of Independence and other documents in, f in the American uh, kind of um, political landscape, you'll find we are born equal. These kinds of terminologies here. We are created equal, even religious language. <laughs> Why? Because religion, and in particular Christian religion, or Judeo-Christian religion, or the Judeo-Christian tradition, was a significant way in which uh, liberals in the beginning actually uh, formed their epistemology. And this idea of being created equal, I mean, how, how are we created equal when we're all different? 
In what sense are we equal? Because they're not talking about we're equal in skin color or equal in height or equal in um, uh, socioeconomic standing because we're not equal in any of those things. In fact, some, are, some people are, are born disabled. Some people are born able, you know, with extra testosterone in the, or whatever it may be. So there are disparities in a biological sense. So in what sense are we born or created equal? What's referred to here is really we're equal in value, that we're all equal, you know, in how moral standing, if you like. But where do they get that from? Because we, we, can't, we can't really argue that point uh, unless you invoke some kind of metaphysical principle. So John Locke was invoking, at that time, a religious metaphysical principle, making specific reference, uh, believe it or not, to Adam and Eve and the book of Genesis and these things. So tradition or Judeo-Christian tradition has a huge impact on the liberal tradition. It has a theology, it's not just hedonism, but ironically you could say, because religion is in many word, uh, senses self-restricting, right? Uh, it's also religion. And so there's an interesting interplay between uh, those two things. So, just to quickly go through some of the, um, the the main things, you have the English Civil War, which if you went to um, I don't know uh, secondary school in this country, you'd have covered. Okay, it's from the year 1641, 1651. Then you have the Bill of Rights in 1689. Now, these Bill of Rights, a lot of them, when they were being formulated, actually used John Locke's ideas. Okay, uh, he was uh, around at that time. So John Locke, he was directly responsible for some of the formulations the political um, formulations, which, exi which happened not just obviously in England, uh, but also in America, as we know, a lot of the stuff there, you know, the founding documents, if you like, the, uh, the, the Constitution, the Declaration of Independence, all these kind of things, they were based on Locke. They were based on Montesquieu and, uh, and Locke as well. Um, so we've mentioned that. Uh, Rousseau was a huge name as well. In 1778, he was around. And then, of course, in 1789, you had the French Revolution and the documents that are related to that revolution are in fact, uh, many of them are based on the works, um, the, the, the political works of John Locke and of Montesquieu and are liber liberally prem premised or predicated. Manuel Kant was a big name and he was also a liberal, but he also put in place something called cosmopolitanism, which is uh, an interesting uh, universalizing idea. Like w the UN actually comes from this idea that lib liberalism should be spread around like liberalism should be spread around. It's, now, not all liberals will say this, and we have to be very, very care, clear and careful with this, because cosmopolitanism is a sub-branch of liberalism. It's not the only branch of liberalism. But how do, you, how do liberals uh, justify expansion, or in America what they refer to as manifest destiny? And this idea of manifest destiny is what westward expansion, literally westward expansion. Uh, when they went to the natives and stuff, they were literally expanding, conquering new land and so on. It's interesting that most, if not all, presidents in the United States believe in this concept of manifest destiny. And there are articles written on this point. But it's westward expansion um, and manifest destiny is the idea that we are going to take over, to put it in a word. It's, it's, it's almost destiny. It is destiny that we, are, we, we will take over with the, our liberal fr framework. And this idea is connected, of course, to Immanuel Kant's idea of cosmopolitanism. So it's important to know these different kinds of permutations of liberalism. And we talked about uh, Mill last time, so we don't need to go into too much detail about him now, but he was a key formulator, of course, of uh, social liberalism. And then you have World War I and World War II. And World War II in particular was very important because obviously after World War II in 1945, you had the UN, uh, which was previously known as the League of Nations. It changed name. It was called the League of Nations. And then in 1939 to 1945, 1945, it changed name to the UN. And that's when um, a lot of the documents that we're going to be looking at today, like the UN Convention of Human Rights, that's when they were written. They were written on a post-war basis. And why, why they were written is to ensure you know, world stability and these kind of things. The League of Nations, remember, uh, before even World War II, was established to create that kind of peace treaties between nations and, and so on. Um, so we're going to look at the uh, Human Rights Declaration, which was written at the same time as Israel became a state in 1948. Now, let's talk about human rights. W when I say human rights, what comes to your mind? What comes to your mind if someone says human rights? 
what, what's the first thing that, is, what connotation that brings about? Is it a positive connotation, let's be honest, or a negative? If you say it's, yeah, it's positive, isn't it? See, what, what other things come to mind? Freedom of speech, freedom of movement. Yes. Um, um, yeah, equality. Equality, equality yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, these kinds of things, right? Yeah. Anything else come to mind? Freedom of religion as well. Freedom of religion. What's the opposite of rights? Responsibilities. So it's very interesting. It's not human responsibilities. It's what? It's human rights. Um, it's, it's not even human rights and responsibilities. It's just human rights. And why is that significant, that it's not human rights and responsibilities or human responsibilities, but human rights? Why is that significant? What, what does it mean to have rights? That's true, that, that's true, yeah, of course. But what does it mean in the first place to have rights? Are you entitled to something? Yeah, that you're entitled to something, you're owed something. Mm. But it do, what does it not mean by extension? That you need to attain it? That you need to attain it, okay, but something else which is more diametrically opposed to the word rights. That you need to. Let's, let's use the word give and take. Mm. Alright, rights is what? Taking or giving? taking so responsibilities are what giving, giving. Oh. if you tell people in a society take these things and you don't tell them give these things what happens what's the problem it's not reciprocal so you're not contributing anything that, um. what could happen theoretically let's put it in more precise language well, if everyone's doing it, you have the freeloader problem. You have the fusion of responsibility, yeah. right? Imagine if you told, if you're raising children, yeah, and you told them you have a right to eat this and you have a right to do that and you have a right to do this, and you're, but you don't tell, you don't discipline them. You don't tell them this is what you have to do, this is what you should do, this is what. What, what kind of children? Are you, what, <laughs> what kind of children are you gonna raise? So, yeah, yeah. And this, uh, this is one of the arguments against uh, liberalism and, and, by extension, human rights culture that it produces um, individualism to a very high level, diffusion of responsibility. Like, <coughs> this actually, this, this, just on a side note, this, this thing of diffusion of responsibility, right? Um, there have been psychological investigations done on it, like someone does, uh, commits rape, yeah? And stranger rape, and it's happening in the street, and the woman is screaming, and for some reason no one's even calling the police. They're too busy eating pot noodles or, or you know, <laughs> or eat, chewing gum or something like that, or playing games, computer games. The woman is screaming outside. It might be at night time, but she, whatever, like, you know, we'll drown it out because I'm busy, you know. So this, this culture of, or this psychological um, phenomena, which is it's referred to as diffusion of responsibility, let someone else deal with it. But it's not my business. It's not, it's, I don't have to do that. It's not my obligation to do that. Why? Because you've already instilled in the person that it's not that they've got rights and they've got responsibilities. But their rights are important. It's a human right for me to do what I want. Who cares about this person here? You know? And so we'll come to this. And in fact, it's very important, very, very important. Criticism of individualism within liberalism referred to as communitarianism. And one of the main, um, well, uh, let me give you two names. Uh, so some of the main names is uh, Michael Sandel. Who, by the way, he has an 11 or 12 part series in Harvard, it's called The Justice. Probably one of the best series that you can watch, yeah, on these points, on these uh, topics, to increase your knowledge on these uh, areas. One of the, because he teaches it very well, and it's very lucid, very clear, very clean. So uh, people ask for book recommendations. Start with this lecture series, because it's a very high quality, very high quality lecture series. Michael Sandel. Harvard lecture series. It's been watched by millions and millions of people, and the production quality of it is second to none. Yeah, but he also writes a book called Theories of Justice, and he he offers a communitarian criticism of individualism, which we'll explore in maybe some more detail in what follows. But let's let's talk about rights now a little bit more. When you when you're talking about rights, human rights, it's already universalized. Okay. So these are the rights that all humans have. Okay, so it's not exceptional. It's not um, 
categorize or these rights for these people and these are rights for other people. Now, obviously, with the premise of equality, all of that makes sense. But then we, we talk about relationships in families. Is the mother and the father the same as the son and the daughter? <laughs> well, for them, I mean, y you'll read and we'll go through this together. The 30 human rights, one of them isn't mother's rights. It's, it's, you don't have a rights for mothers in this formulation. Mothers are not separated and made uh, in any way um, exceptionalized. They're not exceptionalized. Yeah, the category of mother is drowned out in the in the in the transcendental category of human. Human is more important than mother. Mother is no is of no special significance in the th thirty right formulation. Should we give our like in Islam? Obviously, we have the idea of umma kathumma umma kathumma umma kathumma umma ka. Back, you know, your mother, your mother, your mother, your father. Your mother is so important, then your father is important. Now, if uh, th these are the kinds of traditional notions, not just in Islam, <laughs> you have these notions in human rights? Not really. So, what do we find in uh, these countries? You'll find you know, care homes with a lot of people in them dying of COVID right now because their, pa their, their children don't think they have the right to a special treatment from kids because the parents are, you know, they're just humans and there's no special rights given to parents. It's not, inculca it's not inculcated in the culture. It's just something that's, uh, well, well, why should I take care of them? You see, but if, if you have a culture which says, actually, the, the mother, you know, is so important and how, how could you just leave your mother to die in, in, a, in, a, you know, in a care home or, that's a different paradigm altogether. When did human rights as a phrase become popular? Human rights became popular, as you'd probably imagine, after 1948, because before that they were using the term natural rights. And Bentham, he referred to this term as um, nonsense on stilts, he said. He, he, he didn't like it. But Bentham, you know, the utilitarian, he didn't like it. He referred to it as nonsense on stilts. But anyway, at, at the very least, um, after 1945, the term became very popular. And I've, I've, s I've sent something called, and this is a very good, uh, it's called Google Ngram. You look at it and it's like how much a word has been used in books throughout the, the ages. Um, I think I've, 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 uh, I've given you the old uh, slides actually. What I wanted to do at this time, we'll pause. What I want to do before we move on to the state of nature, which is a secondary uh, kind of um, thing that we're going to look at is I want us to look at the human rights, 30 points of human rights, the 30 um, articles, yeah? And I want us just to think about continuities and discontinuities. What are some of the things which are, co are patterns in human rights? And what are some of the things which are discontinuous uh, in, in human rights? And then we'll come back and we'll see some of the things that we've looked at. It's important for us to know what the human rights are, in fact. And for extra points, if, you, if you've done that, then the second thing we look at is we look at some major debates that are happening in today's society and how some of the human rights are being either overutilized or underutilized. And if you want even more points, a third question, okay, a third question is, are there any tensions between human rights? Meaning, could you conceivably see contradictions between the so-called rights that exist within the 30 articles? So just to summarize the three points, continu just general continu uh, co continuities and discontinuities, one. Number two, where some of these rights become relevant in public discourse. And the third thing is, if there are any tensions that may exist within those 30 human rights, then we'll come back for, uh, for um, kind of uh, brainstorming and so on. So let's uh, start, inshallah ta'ala, with the first question that we, what was the first question that we had? What are some of the continuities and discontinuities with with the 30 articles of human rights yeah so yeah. Um, the, the big one that we noticed was basically one of the rights is the right to democracy yes yes um, and that's one that can you know very easily uh, have a there can be a, a tension with all of the other ones because you know if you have a right to democracy and the democratic will is to go against you know any of the other 29 articles give me an example of another 29 article which democracy goes against just one example well, could potentially go against yeah, yeah so for example the freedom of thought and religion 
So if the, if the democratic will, for instance, is to you know take rights away from say the Muslim community or the Christian community, or to say you can't have halal meat or you can't wear hijab, or you can't do all of those things, and you immediately have attention. Okay. Yes, but is is this freedom of say uh, religion that you're speaking about? Is it um, implemented on a state level? Are you talking about on the individual level? I don't understand. The question. So, for example, if you uh, we talk about a Muslim country which is trying to implement Islamic laws, for example, mm -hmm. and where democracy goes against, for example, it says that in the constitution they uh, in Saudi Arabia that yeah. cutting the hand of the thief is, the, and then they dem democratically vote against that. Or are we talking about a situation where in a country like Britain or U USA, someone's uh, religious right is to pray five times a day, but then the majority of democratic voters go against that? Yes, the second case. Yeah, okay, yeah. okay. Give me another example. That was good. That's a very good point, in fact. Democracy is a bit of a double-edged sword, and it can be self-explosive in the same way that we talked about intersectionality and uh, feminism can be it implode upon itself. Um, what other thing apart from freedom of religion are we what can go against democracy or the democratic will of the people so it says here yeah yeah right six it says you have right to you have rights no matter where you go so if you let's just say if you go a country uh, a muslim country hmm. where the majority democratically decided that uh, they don't want uh, lgbt and you're a person that are pro lgbt or you are uh, lgbt part of lgbt uh, you can you have you have a problem there because this is a country that say that again. Say, so, sorry, one more time. Yeah. So you go a country where where uh, democratically they decided that LGBT rights are not part of their part of the right the, the law, and it says here that you are wherever you go, you have a right. So isn't there a right for sexual orientation? It says I'm a person just like you. So no, no, but is there is there because your example was about homosexuality, right, or no, LGBT? Yeah, so it, it can be homosexuality, it can be anything else. Uh, yeah, so okay. If if uh, like you, like you mentioned, uh, cutting the hand for yeah, 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 yeah. So if you think that the thieves uh, shouldn't be cut it off, uh, then and you go to a country where you live in a country where democratically democratically they decided that that is all right, that's that's yes. Then you have a problem there. I think. Great, that's true. This is right. I mean, a more fundamental one is right to life. Yeah. Is, isn't that there? Yes, I'm sure it's there, right? Yeah. Uh, right to life is a liberal, is a very found foundational liberal principle, like right to wel uh, wealth, uh, life, wealth, and uh, what's the other one that they talk about? Yeah, yeah, you know, that's another formulation. Property, yes. Yeah, pro isn't that contradictory to, um, with like abortion laws and stuff like that? Can Could be argued, but more fundamentally, right, death penalty. I mean, in the United States, how many states have got the death penalty? So there's a tension here because it's like, does this person have a right to his life or not? Or does she have a right to her life or not? What if, what if as you say, you have a situation where the, a country democratically elects or democratically votes for a death penalty? 99% of the population say, we want the death penalty. So now there's a democratic mandate for the death penalty, but then there's a tension with life. Because when we use the construction liberal democracy, we, we often assume that these two things are always conciliatory and that they work together and harmonious. But what's sometimes difficult is you have issues where democracy dictates X, but liberalism dictates Y, and they are contradictory. And who's going to arbitrate that? You see, this is a very important question, because if we say, well, the state arbitrates it, then you have to justify that, and you can justify that through the social contract, which we're going to cover. But if you say, well, the individuals are going to uh, arbitrate that, then we have democracy over representation. Anyway, we'll, we'll come to this. And these are tensions. These are tensions that are difficult to arbitrate, basically. And um, so, in, in other words, we should note that human rights are not always consistent with one another. We, we always say we talk about human rights as if they're monolithic and if they all go together and they're all in one direction. But sometimes there's serious com conflicts that and contradictions that a liberal democrat must endure. These liber liberal democrats, they must endure them. Any other contributions before we move on to the, uh, to the next part of the session? If you had a democracy, yes. and then they just voted on something like a law which goes against any of the laws here, then you just have an immediate contradiction. Isn't exactly. It? That's, yeah. a great, that's a great, good way of putting it. Okay. If, you, if you have a democracy, 
which goes against any of the human rights, then you have an immediate contradiction because democracy is one of the human rights. Yeah. You have an immediate contradiction. And how do you endure that contradiction? How do you resolve that contradiction? How do you arbitrate that con contradiction? Then you have to make arguments. But are you going to make an argument where you favor democracy over liberalism? Yeah. Or are you going to make an argument where you're going to favor liberalism over democracy? Mm -hmm. Yes? How, how do you measure human rights? Because it's very interesting. Because when you, How do you measure? When someone says, when a liberal says, this person has a freedom to do so, so, so this A, B, C, D, E, F, G. So the thing is, of, for example, how do you measure? So for example, pornography, they don't class it as some kind of a drug because it doesn't, they don't see that effect, you know, but we know pornography actually destroys. There's even a, a charity, well, not a charity, an organization called um, Porn Pornography Destroys Lives. So how, does, how do they measure it? So this, the, the, the idea of pornography is less about human rights and more about utilitarianism that we spoke about last lesson where you can make an argument on utilitarianism that pornography has more damaging effect on a society than it has a positive effect, it has more harm than it has good, yeah? Human rights are not really concerned with this kind of thing. It's, uh, unless we're talking about sexual exploitation, human trafficking and these kinds of things. It would actually, I mean, if we're being completely honest, pornography should be allowed on this paradigm because pornography is freedom of expression. It should be allowed on freedom of but if you want to make an argument within the paradigm against pornography, you wouldn't use human rights, you'd use utilitarianism. You'd say, well, if you guys believe that's greatest good for the greatest number, you believe in harm principles, you know, so on, um, then you can make an argument that pornography is, is correlated to rape, is correlated to this, is exploitation. A and pornography has been argued against not by liberals per se, but in fact by feminists and uh, by second wave feminists. We talked about this before, it's called, it was called the sex wars in the 1980s and 90s. Um, the feminist sex wars. And you have people like Andrea Dworkin on the one side. She was a radical feminist who uh, vehemently you know, um, attacked the pornography industry. So th there were some people within feminism that vehemently attacked, uh, making arguments similar like exploitation to what we would make, exploitation, objectification and so on. So it, you, it's not like you cannot find arguments, but I wouldn't use human rights for that. I would use, if you wanted to find an argument for pornography, uh, a moral argument, it would be through utilitarianism and or these conceptions within the second world paradigm of feminism. Uh, of course, you can make an, uh, a range of other arguments outside those paradigms as well, but within, if you're speaking to a feminist and you don't want to convert her to Islam before she agrees with you, then you can, you can work within <laughs> her paradigm. If you're speaking to a liberal, then you work within their paradigm just to get them to be convinced of that particular point, but it's a difficult case to make on liberalism. It is a, I have to be honest, if, if we're being completely honest, it's a difficult case to make on liberalism because it's, it would seem to be in line with freedom of expression. All right, let's talk about something very important. This, um, there's something called the state of nature. Okay, now this is a very important thing in liberal theory. So you might think that, and I usually say this in this language, that mythology is confined to the spheres of kind of religion and uh, this kind of things. But much of political philosophy is predicated on mythology, like genuine mythology, genuine. When I say myth, I'm talking about narratives which have no basis in the real world. Like we said, one of the people that have been said to be the, the founders of liberalism, although there is some scholarly disagreement about this, is a man called Thomas Hobbes. And we talked about his book called The Leviathan. And in this uh, book and other books that he writes, he refers to something called the state of nature. Now, what is the state of nature? The state of nature for him is a fictitious state. Okay, it's not something which is, he went out with his uh, psychologist friends and he went out to see how human beings are and he started to say, well, human beings exhibit X, Y, Z trait and therefore the human beings are like this by nature. He didn't do that. He didn't do the work of a cognitive psych uh, psychologist or co cognitive uh, scientist and say this is how human beings are born before socialization. He didn't do any of that. He said that human beings basically are warring by nature. So it's a, everyone's fighting each other. So it's, everyone's attacking each other by nature. Okay? It's a clashing environment. Everyone's clashing by, by nature. Yes? And this is the original state. The original state is everyone's fighting each other. Everyone's beating each other up. Uh, and he says, so what was initially required in order to stop this chaos is you needed people who were beating each other up and clashing and conflicting with each other 
what was that name of the book uh, that they study in uh, in GCSEs that you know the, the Lord, of the Lord of the Flies yeah what's the guy's name that wrote it yes yes you studied that in GCSEs did you yeah did you yeah I used to teach it for GCSEs when I used to teach the English uh, Lord of the Flies this is based on Hobbesian uh, characterizations could you say that Mad Max kind of world is, is like that who Mad Max you know they Everybody's uh, fighting for resources and petrol. You could say that. Why not? And yeah, you could. Machinery and yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. But remember, this is fictitious, right? So it's a fictitious state of nature. It's fake. It's fake. It's a myth. So their religion, the religion of liberalism, is based on a myth. This myth of everyone's fighting each other is a fictitious state. And then there comes along this leader, this big strong man. I'm not talking about Muhammad's hijab, the learned one. <laughs> This big strong man comes along, okay, or, you know, monster. Leviathan actually was a biblical character uh, in the Bible. It was like, you know, and, and or this, uh, this state or something, you know, this, these people, they come along. And these people who are fighting each other come to them and say, look, we're going to give up part of our freedom. We are going to give up part of our freedom in exchange for you to protect us. Okay, which is what happens in marriage, you know. But maybe not for you because you cannot <laughs> provide that service. <laughs> 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 you know, you said, what would initially require to stop this war? And you didn't finish. You said, what Hobbes said. Say again, that. say again. You know, you said that Hobbes said, fictitious nature. And then you said, human beings are at war by nature. This is the, this is the original state. What was initially required to stop this war? Yeah, so you needed this big, strong man. Oh, a big okay, strong sorry, man. Sorry. Yeah, so this, this you know, figurative, metaphoric, uh, this monster yeah. to come and say, look, I'm going to take care of business. Don't mess around. Yeah? Don't mess around. So this big strong monster comes and he says, look, you give me your, you give me your freedom in exchange for I'll give you protection. And this idea of, let's call it the big strong man idea for the monster, this comes and gives the protection, became known as the social contract. So how does the social contract work? Social contract is, we are born free. But then we give our freedom up, or some part of our freedom up, to the big strong man, which is the state or the government, or the parliament, uh, parliament is sovereign in this country. That's, the, that's actually, a, that's actually an, a statement of, uh, it's a statute reality, right? Parliament is sovereign. You give your freedom to whoever it may be that's in charge, and they'll protect you in, in, in return. Now, in truth, this doesn't happen. In the real world, it doesn't happen. What really happens? I mean, where, where were you born? Pakistan. Pakistan. Where were you born? I was born in the UK. Okay. Where were you born? Turkey. That's okay. Where were you born? Sri Lanka. SubhanAllah, this is like what? <laughs> Anyone born anywhere else? Okay. Same place. Okay, when you were born in any of those countries... Say, we didn't ask you, where was you born? <laughs> right here, right here in the, in the great nation. <laughs> in the great nation. What happened was, when we were born, our parents took us to the registry office, or I don't know what they called it. And then they did what they go, your birth certificate. And then they put your name on the birth certificate, and the man, he brought out this nice special pen. Have you ever seen the pen? Have you seen a pen? No, no, no. The man, <laughs> it's like a, it's a very special ink and all this kind of thing. And put your name in it, and that's it. You are now part of the the country. You are. You are. Then after that, what happens is after a while, take a picture of the child. You send it to whoever you send it to, and then they give you what a passport. I know you're still waiting for one of those, but <laughs> but they give you a passport. Red, now they've made it black, sometimes it's blue, in other countries it's green, and sometimes purple. <laughs> now, I want to ask a question. At what point did we agree? Because when you have the passport, when you have that passport or that document or the birth certificate or any of that stuff, now you have to obey what? So you, have to you have to obey the law, right? Yeah. And what happens if you don't obey the law? You're in trouble. You're in trouble. So we go back to what? The social, how do they justify this? Why are they taking away my... Because me... Look, look, think about it. Me, obeying the law is an infringement of my liberties, of my freedom. How do you justify 
forcing me to drive 30 miles an hour. How, how dare you <laughs> right, tell me to drive there? And if not, I have to do the speed awareness course that I've done four times. <laughs> you see. Or I have to, you know, whatever it may be, uh, drive this, uh, do that. If I slap somebody I don't like, I have to go to something. You know, why do I? Okay, fine. That one, we can do the harm principle. But still, you know, I can't do certain things. Why? Because the law says so. Why? Because there's a social contract. That's how, on liberalism, how they justify it. We've given up part of our freedom in exchange for what? Protection. Because they'll tell you, but don't you also benefit from the police? Well, I don't, to be honest. Do you benefit from the ambulance? Yes, yeah, sometimes. You know, sometimes not, to be honest. Do you benefit from the army? Well, actually, I my people are not benefiting from the army in the least. But put that all to the side. You're benefiting from the NHS or this or that, or whatever. So we're protecting you. We're saving your life. We're helping you out. In exchange for your freedom. Yes? But I never made that contract. I never signed anything. It was my mum who signed, or, or my dad w went to the place, and it was I was forced. Let's be honest, into a social contract. Also, also your mum and dad were forced because yes. they didn't get in trouble. Exactly. It good. Yeah. Very good. But you know, so what's the difference between the fictitious, the fake, the myth state of nature, mm -hmm. which Hobbes is talking about, mm -hmm. and the real reality? What's the one major difference? Yes, that's right. Uh, you don't decide. In the, in the fictitious state of nature, the, 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 the people in society, they're going to the big strong man and saying, we're going to volitionally give you. But in reality, none of the social contracts ever... It's a contract that I was forced into. It's like a forced marriage. It is a f they talk about forced marriage. I have been forced into the marriage of citizenship. You see. And I've been compelled into obeying the law. Now... On liberalism, this is really difficult because how can you justify taking my freedom away in this manner? You have to justify it through the social contract, just purely on liberalism. But the social contract, sh if for, for it to be really efficacious and to be genuine and legitimate, like any contract in liberalism, it has to be reciprocal and transactional and both parties must agree. But that doesn't happen. So you do have a problem. Some liberals will say that <clears throat> that even though it looks like you're potentially being forced into this situation, what's really happening is that you're being guaranteed the most amount of freedom you could feasibly have. Because without that being the case, then within a state of nature, you're going to have a net sort of less amount of freedom. If that makes sense. Of course, that that's that is what it's not. It's not what they will say. It's what they'll say. It's the lesser of two evils. It's not what we want, you know. And depending on where they are on the spectrum, they want more or less intervention. So uh, we mentioned Robert Nozick, who wrote State, Anarchy and Utopia. It's a very important book, actually. And he basically argues that you should have a very small state that does minimal work. Oh, my God. Yeah. Uh, and others argue uh, the opposite, right? Sorry. So anyway, um, just to move on. Locke. John Locke had a different idea of the state of nature. He said, we're not all fighting each other. He said, all mankind who will but consult it, that being all equal and independent, no one ought to harm another life, liberty or possessions. He had more of a positive and optimistic understanding of the human condition. The human condition is being defined differently by these liberals. But it's interesting how they all define it differently but come to the same conclusion. So Hobbes is they're all fighting each other. Locke is not, and they're not fighting each other. They're more maybe conciliatory, but they're all saying what we need is someone to come and take control of the situation. Now, this is extremely important now. You're starting with a social, we said it's a mythological state of nature. It's fictitious because it didn't happen the way they are describing. There was no transaction that took place. There was no Leviathan. There was no whatever. What really happened, I was born in this country and I was given a birth certificate. But we didn't consent, yeah? So what you'll find is that this is really, really interesting. Is liberalism and authoritarianism in any way conceivable to be put together? Can Hitler, who was socially liberal in many ways, he was socially liberal in many ways, you know, can fascism coexist with liberalism? Can, is there such a thing as liberal fascism? Well, if you have a very strong theory of 
social contract, a contract, you can justify it. And I'll tell you how. Look at what Kant says. He, is, he says, it is the duty of the people to bear any abuse of the supreme power. Can you imagine? Emmanuel Kant. I'm going to give you the slides. Don't worry. Don't worry. Yeah, yeah. Go slides. I'll send it to you. It is the duty of the people to bear any abuse of the supreme power, even though, even then though, it should be considered to be unbearable. And the reason is that any resistance, any resistance of the highest legislative authority can never but be contrary to the law and must even be regarded as tending to destroy the whole legal constitution. In order to be entitled to offer such resistance, a public law would be required to permit it. But the supreme legislation, capital L, capital S, uh, capital S, capital L, would be such a law cease be supreme and the people people as subjects would, uh, would ma be made sovereign over the, uh, that which they are subject, which is a contradiction. Which is a contradiction. He's saying it's not possible that now these people who the sovereign is, is meant to be protecting and, and they are subject to, that they're going to tell the law what to do. This is, you could be reading out of Mein Kampf or something like that because this is very much an authoritarian understanding of how things should be. But it is not something which is foreign to liberal thought. You cannot argue it's impossible on liberal thought because with social contractarianism, these arguments can be made. They simply ha can be made and they have been made. And uh, I've mentioned this before and I'll mention it again. John Locke, unsurprisingly, we talk about the apostasy law. He, sa he states, the first, it talks about Jewish states. The first of those being initiated in the mos mosaical, or should be mosaic, let's say, rites, and made citizens of that commonwealth, did afterwards apostatize from the worship of God of Israel. These were proce uh, proceeded against as traitors and rebels, guilty of no less than high treason. For the commonwealth of Jews, different uh, in that from all others, was an absolute theocracy. Nor was there, co or could there be, any difference between a commonwealth and a church. He's basically saying, you can kill the apostate. John Locke. The, now, someone will say, well, we don't agree with John Locke. He, it's not about agreeing or disagreeing with John Locke. It's about, it's possible on social contractarianism. It's, pos it's possible on this form of liberalism. You have an apostasy law. He's literally mentioning an apostasy law. And he's saying it's possible that someone can be killed for apostatizing in a country because they are seen as rebels and traitors to the theocracy. The same understanding as Immanuel Kant, that you have the supreme law, and if you go against it, then you can be killed for it. You know, and John Rawls, who came in the 20th century, he, he made some very fascinating uh, comments to the effect of, you can stand, if, so, if, the, if the supreme leader told you to stand in the face of the cannon, cannon, like a suicide mission, basically, that you have to and you should answer this. Why? Because of contractarianism. It makes sense on contractarianism. Why not? When you've sacrificed your freedom. What is the use, therefore, I could ask, of freedom if, you're, if, if you, you have it and lose it straight away? It's almost like, you know, the Christian tradition where it says, you're born with original sin and then Jesus comes and takes it away. So what, what's, what, what am I doing here then? It's like this whole mythology has taken place and I've, uh, I've been completely uh, excluded from it. You've told the story already. I'm, no, I'm a superfluous addition to the story. I was given freedom and, and that freedom was taken away from me all before I was born. And when I was born, I'm now subject to these laws which could meet, to meet out my death. And so the death penalty from this perspective can be justified. So there are contradictions within liberalism because on one hand you have to protect life but on the other hand the social, social contract idea says well the supreme leader is in charge. So you have not only contradictions between liberalism and democracy but contradictions between notions of liberalism from within the theory itself because contractarianism is very, um, it, it's very straightforward actually. So now if you go back to the Islamic thing Obviously, classically, there has been the Ridda laws and so on, which um, many of the as uh, in fact, uh, one of the Hanafi jurists, he, he actually literally said this is treason and he gave very similar reasoning as did uh, in his book Mabsut, by the way. He has a book called uh, Al Mabsut and he gives the same, ex almost an identical reasoning. He said they're rebels, they're traitors, blah, you know, all this kind of thing. To who? To John Locke. So it's conceivable on theory that it can be for the same reason. Now, here's what I say. 
this is actually a point of similarity between Muslims and liberals, if you like, or Islam and liberalism as a political theory. Because Islam doesn't say you are born free and... No, it doesn't say that in, that in that language. But it does say we have a contract. We have a contract with God and we have a contract with the supreme leader. The idea is the same. The idea is, I in fact, identical. Can we say that in Islam we're promoting... Uh, we're promoting Communitarism, community. Yes, yes. Uh, but here they they wanna they pr they promoting individualism. Right, right. The laws are different, but the structures in terms of social contract are exactly the same. Mm -hmm. You have subject, and then you have the supreme leader. You have the Khalifa, you have the Wazir, or wh whoever it is. And there is Ta'at Wali Al Amr. There is you have to obey the, the supreme leader. <laughs> and some uh, some people go too far in this uh, regard. You know, we've seen. Uh, you know, some groups of Islam, you know, they, they say, even if he rapes my wife in front of me, that's disgusting. You know, this is not what we're talking about. There's always limits. In fact, there's limits in Islam of these things. But the idea is, generally speaking, you know, there should be obedience to the supreme leader, otherwise ca chaos would ensue. Liberalism doesn't actually disagree, except for the anarchical strands of liberal kind of thought or moving into, like, libertarianism and stuff like that, which we talked about with Nozick as a prime academic example. But having said that, the idea of, okay, you have these laws for this protection, whether it's military protection or pensions that you're given or whatever the government gives, is that's identical. So if someone says, why is it in your religion that you have all these laws of uh, death penalty and ridda and all these kind of things? A very simple answer is we have a structure which is identical to the liberal structure. And the main argument will be, it's conceivable in both liberal structures and Islamic structures that those laws are implemented and or waived. Just as these structures have been, and have been shown to be implemented in these countries, they've also been shown to be waived. Now, I've written a book, a very small book. It's called The Liberal Critiques of Ridda. It's a green book. You can buy it. And in it, really, I argue that in implementation, because this is very important, in implementation, when it comes to these things like death penalty and stuff, there's no evidence, especially if we look throughout history, that there is more, w when it comes to Ridda, for instance, there is more implementation of Ridda laws than there are of treason laws. There's no evidence of that. There is something called, in the Ottoman records, because they're the most well kept, it's called the Sijil records. And they're written in Ottoman um, language, okay? So they needed the translator, they called the Sijil, right? And fair enough, it's not a complete record, just like in any history, there's not complete records. But the Sijil, you can see basically the the record from Bayezid II, I think it was, all the way up to Abdul Hamid II, or all the way, and beyond, and beyond, after the, what you call the Tanzimat reforms in the mid-19th century. This is a wide or like a big p chunk of, you don't, if you do a search on the sajil, because you can actually do so e electronically, you will not find, and write ridda or keywords, you will not find more than a handful of cases. And most of the cases were pardons. That there was no such implementation of the death penalty because someone has changed their religion. In fact, in my book, I, I give an example within, I think it was the years, 1860 to 1870, or something like this, because, as you know, the American Civil War took place between 1861 and 1865. And this civil war uh, saw death penalties take place, death penalties, because of symbolic acts of treason, not just military acts of treason. So the, the case study I give in the book is of a man called William Mumford. And William Mumford, he basically, you know, the, the flags were different the new Union flag versus, the and so he, he, he was burning the flag, or he burned the flag, yeah? So they took him, and they, in front of everybody, put the rope around his neck and killed him. And it was, you know, it, this, they killed him for what? They killed him for a symbolic act of treason. So I looked at the same time period, in the Sajil records, in the Ottoman Empire, because funny enough, at that same time, the Ottomans were having a civil war. You could say it's civil, or you could say it's with the Greeks, depending on well, <laughs> you know, how you define it. And a lot of Greeks were becoming Muslim, 
but then apostatizing just like you know some two weeks after or something like that because they had uh, wanted to test the Ottoman groups and I picked out the only available court record uh, judgment ruling on this particular uh, case what I found they were Hanafi and they used Maslaha a lot in their judgments which is the idea of the common good the greater good they waived they waived that particular person who became an apostate who was a Muslim and then went to being Christian and they didn't execute them so the Ottoman Empire at the same time where America was executing someone for a symbolic act of treachery so in implementation because the argument is well what kind of argument can you make we're saying that it's conceivable that these we're not saying it's inconceivable that in Islam these things cannot be implemented and we're not saying that it's inconceivable that it will uh, it will always be implemented in the liberal tradition I'm saying it's conceivable on both traditions that these things can be implemented and it's conceivable on both traditions that these things can be waived so there's so therefore if it's conceivable on both liberalism and Islam that ridda and or treason can be punished or waived in that case the liberal critique of Islam is fruitless and self-refuting it's a shot in the foot because if you don't like the way this works you've got the same exact structure it's not about the individual opinions because this is I've made these arguments before and someone says well I don't agree with John Locke I don't agree with Emmanuel Kant I don't agree with John Rawls I don't agree with Rousseau I don't agree with any of them fine you don't have to agree with any of them but the truth of the matter is this is on principle how social contractarianism or liberal contractarianism works it's a principle issue the usul of the madhab if you want to put it in that language allows it it allows it on both madhab uh, the islamic of uh, madrasa of you know religion deen and the and the liberal deen if you want to put it in that language as well the religion of liberalism why, why i call it a religion because depending on how you define religion i mean emil durkheim sociologist he, def he defined religion as a set of ideas and He's a huge, so why not take that uh, definition of religion? It doesn't have to be divine worship. And uh, you still have symbols and important words and, and practices and, and, and you know, human rights. And it works in a very religious way. So the liberal, if you want to put it that way, religion allows it in some cases. Historically, it has implemented it for symbolic cases. And I say symbolic, not military cases. Treason, espionage and treachery and betrayal in America has not been and does not even continue to be the exclusive property of what of a military operation that is done against a state no it can be symbolic it can be uh, things that and we've, we've we've given that example of william mumford but these examples can be given even easier on these people that they kill with drone attacks without even trials and by the way how do they justify it because it's protection of the state. It's, it really is a social contractarian understanding. And even then, there's, there's peer-reviewed written articles arguing of the neoconservative strand of liberalism, because it is even in that. Neoconservatism is underneath liberalism. You know, that these things are pl plausible and possible and sometimes even preferred. So when someone comes with, why does your religion allow this? Say, First of all, you answer the question, okay, is that morality, blah, 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 you know, whatever. And it's not always the case, as we know, it's conceivable. But then your religion allows it as well, if you want to put it that way. Your religion allows that as well, actually. You know, and if you, if you eliminate the social contract element, then you have anarchy. So either you let the state kill the people or you let the people kill the people. One more time, say that again. Either you let the state kill the people, or you let the people kill the people. Because you think anarchy is going to produce a net uh, aggregate, less number of people that are going to be killed. Look at, yeah, look at, look at these states that are failed states. They're great examples, Yemen or uh, Libya. Like, who, uh, is there more death or less death? When there's not a strong authority, then there's 
oftentimes much more death because everyone's trying to get their little plot of land or tribal warfare and all this kind of we see this all the time so it's you can't get away from killing people in societies in history so either you let the people kill the people or you let the state kill the people now you might say well it doesn't have to kill the people you can just put them in prison fine you let the people punish the people or you let the state punish the people punishment is a part of the human condition obviously Hobbes believes that more than most of us probably would uh, agree with him on this point but these are the issues relating to how to govern human beings having said that guys this is the end of today's session and it was a bit of a long session but an important one and I hope this has helped you as much as it's helped me we're going to continue and do some discussions here and until next time, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.